Welcome to the World of CONCACAF podcast news desk. I'm Eric Schmitz. I'm Jonathan Sleep. And I'm Donald Wine. And we are back, finally. It's It's been a minute. Uh, we took a little bit of a break, unintentionally, but we had a CONCACAF Nations League draw, so we have to be like immediate on top of it for this. So Nations this is League, what we live for. This is what we live for. We're all ready for this. I full disclosure before we get started is that it is Nations League. So in the spirit of that, none of us are wearing sleeves right now. Uh, we, we are in full uniform for the CONCACAF Nations League. I was going to uh, say, like, we're ready for CONCACAF Nations League, but I don't know if CONCACAF is ready. Um, considering ready. the things that took place during the draw, the fact that it is only, you know, we are almost two hours post draw. And they just put up an article that the draw even happened. Um, and then we're going to get into what other wild things we have no idea about. Can we can we just start? But I, I I know we have a rundown, but can we just start with just how the draw took place in, in some of the the yes. issues, I will say, that we had? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I know, Eric, you were you were rushing home from work, but you were following along Uh Jonathan and I were were watching on our various TVs and, and devices. And I will tell you, for the first 19 minutes of the draw, you could see what was going on, but you couldn't hear anything because there was no audio in Paramount Plus. And like it was to the point where I thought I was crazy. I was checking my TV, like checking other channels. I checked my phone. I checked it on my computer. I even I almost broke out my laptop before like I wisened up and said, it's not you. It's it's them. Uh, so uh, finally, after 19 minutes, they pulled the feed, put it back on, still with no audio. Then they pulled it off and put the audio on there, but no video. Then they pulled it again, and then finally they were able to get it right. I don't even know if it was synced, like you know, because sometimes on Paramount Plus, like the the lips don't match the uh, what what they're saying. But at that point, I didn't care. We finally had it. It took 19 minutes, but finally it was hope just in time for the actual pulling of the ping pong balls yeah i mean it is concaf nations league and we always say that nations league it really is the essence of concaf so staying on brand is very important so the draws happen let's kind of run through it this is of course for the 2023 24 edition of the nations league the third edition of the greatest competition in global sport um because it is concaf and it is uh, centerpiece competition. We are in the third edition and have a massive format change already. Um, so just to review that, because I know we have talked about it in the podcast before, uh, your top four teams in CONCACAF, uh, your Mexico, United States, Costa Rica, and Canada, they're all getting a bye to the brand new quarterfinal round, which there had been no quarterfinals previously. They're getting a bye. They're Moving teams up to League A, didn't relegate anybody to League B. League B got four teams from League C, and League C is just smaller for these next two editions. Uh, so no relegation after this not yet completed 22-23 edition. Um, but yeah, now we have a draw for the next edition. So let's run through the leagues, and just go through the groups in each league and what sticks out to us. So, Jonathan, why don't you start uh, start us off with League C, which is truly, like, the most concacaf of all the leagues. Uh, yeah, I was going to I was gonna call League C the most important, or, or like, actually, let's say uh, the most fun league yeah. of CONCACAF yeah. Nation. The most league. ideal. The, ideal. The most ideal. Um, the league I would like the U.S. to get relegated to. Um, so, League C in Group A, we have Bonaire, St. Martin of the French variety, uh, Anguilla. In Group B, we have Aruba, the Cayman Islands, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And then in Group C, we have Dominica, Turks and Caicos, and the British Virgin Islands. Now, we got some small groups, very even groups, if you look at the CONCACAF rankings. Um, Donald, is there anything you see here that you're looking forward to? Yeah, well, Eric, you and I went to uh, – there's a rematch uh, of a match that we went to, uh, Cayman mm -hmm. Islands and U.S. Virgin Islands. I think this time around we have to figure out how to get to the U.S. Virgin Islands to see the re the return leg yeah. uh, of this. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, Cayman Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands, throw out the record books. 
as they say. Uh, Jonathan, anything stick out to you? I mean, I think probably the most interesting thing to me is Anguilla versus Bonaire. I mean, I know there is some history as associations, but yeah, no, I think that's probably the one that I'm that I'm looking at, uh, hoping that maybe uh, Anguilla can get a win. For me, looks like Turks and Caicos might have a way to get some results. You know, possibly look at some promotion prospects. Um, Bridge for Jones has had a rough go recently, and Dominica hasn't been great. So, uh, yeah, League C. I mean, fall in the islands, can't get anything better than Nations League. Uh, let's move on to League B. Donald, let's go through the groups. Yeah, let's get into it. So we have Group A, we have Guadeloupe, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Martin of the Dutch variety. Group B, we have Trinidad and Tobago, Dominican Republic, Montserrat, and Barbados. Group C, we have French Guiana, Bermuda, our, our, our people, the Vinci Heat, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Belize. And then finally, we have Group D, Guyana, Antigua and Barbuda, Puerto Rico, and the Bahamas. Jonathan, which group are you looking at? You know, I, I'm going. I was going through this earlier, and I was saying like, there's these groups are pretty evenly matched. Um, I think maybe what I'm looking at the most is Group D. Um, would love to see Puerto Rico get up to League A, uh, and I think there's going to be an interest, some interesting matchups with them and both the Bahamas uh, and and to Tigua and Barbuda. But th- that's probably the group that I'm looking at the most, mainly because. Um, I've really enjoyed what we've seen from Puerto Rico thus far. Uh, and, you know, always want to see them do better. Yeah. for I mean, for me, League B, Trinidad and Tobago, obviously you would think that that's like the front runner of the group. But Dominican Republic has been good lately. Montserrat has always put up some results. Barbados has been weak, but Trinidad is not going to be running away with that group. Um, so that's something I'm looking forward to. What about you, Donald? It's Group B. We got a bowl bowl matchup, ladies and gentlemen. Trinidad and Tobago <laughs> will face Montserrat twice. We got two bowl bowl matchups. I can't be more excited for that. I will say the other the, the bowl, last, bowl bowl the bowl bowl yeah. bowl. Um, I will say I do want to interject one quick thing on Group A. I'm really interested. You know, St. Kitts and Nevis. We saw them make it pretty far in World Cup qualifying, um, and St. Lucia missed out uh, after withdrawing from World Cup qualifying. So I'm really interested to see how St. Lucia does. Um, really into league or into you know nations league and and league B. So that's something else I'm looking at. And you have a second team, Saint Martin, the the Dutch Saint Martin, also got promoted along with Saint Lucia from League C. So uh, you have two in that in that uh pot right there, or at least in that group right there. So that's going to be interesting because they're used to playing each other. But Saint Lucia, I believe, was one of two teams throughout all of nations league group stage this past time around that went undefeated. Yeah, that's, that is true. Uh, also in group A, three of the four are saints. So, you know, the holiest statistics, you know, analytics. And Guadalupe is a saint. So <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. All right. So moving on to league A again, league A does not include the top four ranked teams in CONCACAF, but we've got two groups. Panama, Group A is going to be Panama, Guatemala, El Salvador, Martinique, Curaçao, and Nicaragua. And in Group B is going to be Haiti, Jamaica, Honduras, Cuba, Suriname, and Grenada. Now, remember, there was no relegation from League A after the last cycle. But the interesting thing to note about these two groups is that they are playing Swiss style, quote unquote, Swiss style. Uh, scheduling so there's only four match days and there are six teams in the group so not everybody is playing everyone in the group so CONCACAF to my knowledge I have not seen any information as to how they're going to do the scheduling for this but they're each of these groups the teams are only playing four games so I'm really interested to see how that plays out Uh, as far as like the groupings go Donald which side are you looking at most? So first off, I think something that was interesting about the way they drew this is that for the other ones, we had three pots. You know, League C, we had three pots of three teams. In League B, we had 
four pots of four teams. In League A, we had six pots of two teams. So this draw went very quickly because basically each, you know, the two teams were basically paired up against each other. And you knew, you know, kind of how this was going to shape up pretty quickly because they only had to draw really one name for you to know where the other one was going. So uh, I, having said that, I think the group B, you know, Haiti, Jamaica was in, you know, was in qualifying, was in the octagonal. Honduras was in the octagonal. Cuba, no stranger to League A. Suriname, no stranger to League A. Grenada, no stranger to League A. We have a lot of strong teams in here that know how to play against top teams. And I think the the real, you know, crux of this is, you know, two of these teams are going to make it to the Nations League quarterfinals, and one of these teams is going to get relegated. And one of these teams may get relegated without playing the team that's directly above them. I think that might there might be some cruel... Uh, cruelness at the end of this because there may be either some team missing out on the Nations League playoffs or some team getting relegated without having a full say in the matter because of the Swiss style where we don't get to play everybody in the group. I think the cruelness of this is really that we don't get to travel as much. Yes. For this. I mean, yeah, that's that's most definitely the the cruelness of it all. I will say, like, I'm I'm I think I've gone on record multiple times on this podcast of how much I want to go to Curacao. Um, and it's so, on wax. Yeah, it's uh, I may or may not have already looked at reserving hotels in, in November, <laughs> um, which is getting ahead of myself. Um, but definitely, I think Group B has the opportunity for the most interesting game. You know, we've gone to Jamaica plenty of times, but Haiti, Cuba. Suriname, um, you know, Honduras. I wouldn't hate it, another trip back to Grenada, even though we just went. Um, so and so that's what I'm lo- that's what I'm looking for the most. Um, is out of Group B, who comes out of it? And I mean, like you, like you've all said, who are we, who is even playing each other? Yeah. Um, and I think the scheduling is really going to play into it more in Group A. I mean, El Salvador is historically been pretty good at getting results but these are all fairly even teams like is is el salvador gonna be getting panama or in curacao at home is is that the draw they get are they gonna have to go on the road to play any of these tough games um i'm just curious as to see how the pairings work out because i think group a is definitely where you actually might get a little bit of movement some shocks uh, Cause I think these are all games that are going to be tight games. Um, even Nicaragua has been playing better of late curse out. You would assume they're going to get some results. I mean, even Martinique group a could really be a wild card, but we also don't know the group a top two and the group B top two are going to move on to the quarterfinals. We have no idea how they're getting seated into mm-hmm. the quarterfinals. Like well, it we, all it all we the know releases. the seeds. We know the seeds, right? We so know we the know... top four seeds. We know right. the top four seeds have already been set, but we don't mm-hmm. know how the group the league A teams that advance, we have no idea how they're gonna be seeded in. Mm-hmm. But is it gonna be by ranking? Is it gonna be by finish? Is it gonna be by finish within the groups or is it finish overall? Is it cocky no, half I... rankings? Is it FIFA rankings? We've like <laughs> I I spent is it about drawing thirty lots? minutes. Like... I spent yeah. about 30 minutes combing through like all of the press releases and documents and 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 any of that from CONCACAF. But uh, I think they're very much of the opinion. Uh, they can't hold you to it if you don't put it in writing. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe the CONCACAF officials are planning on just going to the roulette table and seeing what comes up. And that's going to be how they set the rankings. Um, I, I don't know. But this is one of the things, you know. Cockacaf. Of course, they don't have everything set up. They even if they did have it set up, they might change their minds between now and November. Cockacaf always reminds me of whose line is it anyway. <laughs> the rules are made up and the points don't matter. Yeah, no. Calvin, that Ball. is the this score is, is why, to twelve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is why we do the podcast. We try to explain the inexplicable. You know. Um. So yeah, Nations League. Again, the 22-23 edition about to wrap up next month in Vegas. We are inside one month from the semifinals. I can't wait. 
It's going to be a great week in the desert, you know, roaming around the strip, watching soccer, hanging out in the pool. Vibe. The vibes will be dry and hot. So, ring, ring. <laughs> all right. So that's enough Nations League. We do have other stuff going around going on around CONCACAF that we want to talk about since we're here at the news desk and we haven't really had a podcast in a month and a half. Um, thanks to everyone for sticking with us. Thank you especially to our patrons who we didn't thank at the top of the podcast. Uh, again, patreon.com slash podcacaf. Support the podcast. Get extra content. We'll be doing a one more round episode about the first topic in our around CONCACAF segment. Um, tune in. Support us. We appreciate it. So around CONCACAF, the big news today, because we are recording May 16th, the USA gets a big commitment. Jonathan, tell us all about it. Yeah, so I I think we touched on this briefly in our in our you know review of CONCACAF Nations League, um, but the U.S. has been hot after a prospect, um, a U.S. international of uh, both U.S. Um, Nigerian and um, British descent, uh, Florian Balagoon officially announced his decision and filed his one-time switch to represent the U.S. men's national team. Uh, so he is the the first and you know kind of a big long line of uh, dual nationals that have chosen to commit to the the national team. Uh, he currently plays for Rim in the French uh, Ligue 1, and uh, you know he's got 20 20. 19 goals, three assists uh, through, you know, 34 appearances. He's on loan from Arsenal. Uh, I, you know, it, he is, there was a big push in the last uh, window from U.S. fans really trying to sway uh, flow from, you know, not from, to joining the United States. And, uh, you know, we woke all woke up this morning to a nice little surprise. Donald, what, what was your reaction this morning when you saw the news? Euphoria. I mean, we'll go into it more on one more round, but it, it was it was a surprise that he did it so early. Um, I know there was reports last week that England was considering calling them calling him in for their Nations League uh, this summer. I think that's probably what prompted him to file the switch because he was like, "I can be in Vegas, and you want me to be in Moldova? <laughs> Not going to do that." It wasn't so, the reports weren't just that he was potentially going to get called in; it was that he was going to be called in and was going to accept. Mm-hmm. And Those reports the US clearly was trying wrong. To, and the U.S. was trying to, like, dissuade him from doing that. Apparently, we just said, yo, man, you could be in Vegas. Yeah. Or, and then, like, you know, in the fall, you can be in, you know, Curacao, Jamaica. Yeah. yeah. I think his decision was um, the amount of content that was put out today by U.S. soccer leads me to believe that this was not like, you know, you know, two days ago. He was like, yo, I think that. Yeah. yeah. Like when those when those reports were getting floated last week, I think it was pretty like from what we've seen and all the content that's gonna like that was done. Like he had already filed yeah. the switch. I think the, the most switch was approved on uh the switch was approved today. He filed it last week. Yeah, yeah. I'm just more surprised that that stayed quiet. Yeah, well, the mo- is the most surprising thing to me. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if those rumors and reports were getting floated out there to try to like dissuade him at the last minute. That was like a Hail Mary to get him from actually filing the paperwork. But I mean, for all of us, I feel like we were fairly confident after that trip in March that it's like, mm-hmm. yo, he's probably gonna he's probably coming to the US. And like I get it. If you got a Nations League window coming up, UEFA, CONCACAF, some random countries in Europe, Vegas, winning one, not winning one. I mean, I I get the appeal, and the it's just a, a huge, massive get for the U.S. program. Like, they have a star striker. I mean, one of the reasons you always talk a lot about, like, Canada being a threat is because, like, they have Jonathan David. No one else does. Now the U.S. has a star up top, and dude's going to be 24 in 2026. Look, yeah, I think, I think if, he, if, he had, if he had gone to Orlando, which he did in March, which mm-hmm. is where the U.S. happened to be playing a game and they were training, 
He did the whole like Florida circuit, went to all the spring training and the Orlando Magic games and got all the jerseys and was hanging out with basically with every celebrity that could possibly want to go to Orlando. He was doing that. If he had done all that and came back and said, nah, I'm going to still go to England, it would have been the biggest troll job. And man probably would have been hated for the rest of his life by Americans. But he did comment saying that uh, all the love that, you know, American fans were showing him uh, didn't necessarily like lead him to make his decision but he was like it was very much well received and heard and uh he appreciated that fact and i think honestly you know the combination of that the team the coaching staff kind of letting him know what his role would be and how he could prosper in in the u.s system i think was the was the matchmaker for him yeah Yeah, it's important to remember if you're on social media and a u.s fan bullying works <laughs> so post those flag emojis to any dual national out there because it and our national we're batting like a we're batting like a thousand on these right I, now i was gonna say i wasn't donald you said you know u.s fans like if he did the whole tour i was more just gonna blame florida um because <laughs> i mean mm-hmm. let's be honest it's not the great representation of this country um and uh Especially with the, the Florida is still committed. That's yeah, case. yeah. He would. Yeah. That's like going to Ohio and making the decision to commit. Mm. Listen, let's let's be realistic here. Um, but yeah, big news. We're gonna talk more about it on one more round, uh, which you can hear if you subscribe to our Patreon at patreoncom podcast. But we've got some more hey, news. What, I, I, I just want to break in because there's some late breaking news, and I just want to plug it real quick. Uh, yes. Apparently, this is uh, of course these are just rumors right now. But ESPN is reporting that Real Madrid is among teams that are going after Alfonso Davies this summer. Oh, oh! I'm here to tell you, as a Real Madrid fan, you can go ahead and make that make that happen. Go just go ahead and make that happen. Sorry for the interruption. Just want, that was just late breaking news. We'll cover it more probably on our Patreon. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, that's a big move. Real Madrid, it's a tiny club, you know. Small, if, small clubs. Yeah. Have they have they won anything? I don't know. Maybe they've won here and there. All right. Um. So yeah, big news for the folks up north. Now heading geographically from where we are down south. Um. Andres Guardado announced his international retirement today. Uh. He is stepping away from the Mexican national team. He said put out a statement on his Instagram. Uh. All my teammates, the different coaching staff, all the staff who are a very important part of the day, and of course all loyal fans who have accompanied me throughout all these years, I am one of you now. Uh, thank you. He said that, but in Spanish. Um, I did read the translation. But Guardado, after 16 years with the Mexican national team, um, surprised he retired now. I believe Kellen Acosta already told him he was retired in 2020. I, I, I was actually going to quote uh, Kellen Acosta as my parting words to uh, Andres Guardado. Um, you are about to let your country down. <laughs> <laughs> and he, it took him a couple of years to heed those words. Um, but nice little Instagram story, video he put out. Um, so yeah, big change. You know, that's he's had a lot of caps for Mexico. So um, happy. Go ahead. I will say just from an objective standpoint, you know, Andres Guardado, one of the, you know, great players that CONCACAF has seen in a long time. Like just, you know, the All longevity and how yeah. 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 And what he's what he's done uh, for Mexico. I know Mexico fans like he he's going to be a legend there forever. Uh, my U.S. sense says, boy, bye. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you did bring it up. I might as well like give him the credit where credit's due. Guardado yeah. played in 181 games, a Mexican record, uh, scored 28 international goals from 2005 to 2022. He won three gold cup titles uh, and a CONCACAF cup in 2015. He was the CONCACAF gold cup gold ball winner in 2015 and was a member of the CONCACAF best 11 in 15, 16, and 18. So, and that 181 caps, I think, is like top five all time for men for male players. Like, yeah, for national it, team, that is an absurd number for mm-hmm. men's national teams. One of just a few players to have ever played in five World Cups as well. Yeah, so heck of a career for uh, Andres Guardado, who is no longer sick of losing Nations Leagues to the U.S understandable and he retired just in time to not have to lose another one exactly 
<laughs> He's like, I ain't playing in a third place game. Um, all right. So moving on, one of the things we talk about a lot on this podcast is kits. So Donald, we've got a new kit out there. Uh, who's who's looking sharp now? Well, this team is Cuba, and they actually have three kits. They released a home, an away, and a third. And let me tell you, uh, this is a big come up, a big, big come up for Cuba. Their their uh, Joma uh, is their sponsor, uh, or at least their their kit supplier. Uh, and I'll describe them very quickly for people. Obviously, we'll post links where where you can see them. I think you've already done that oh, uh, yeah. on Twitter. Uh, but they have a jersey that is a navy blue with a white stripe in the middle, and then a red bottom. For American fans, it looks sort of similar to the Bomb Pop jersey. You'll get it's those vibes Pop. when you see it. Yeah, it's like a slim, slimmer version uh, of the of the Bomb Pop. There's a white jersey that kind of has a, a stripe going across the uh, the top there, and it's in blue and navy and red. And then there's a third jersey that is uh that is red. I'm sorry, that is navy, and then it kind of has like white going down the side. So very very cool um th- they look great and also their their new crest i think i think that's new I, I think i don't think we've covered that but that that crest either is new or very very recent it looks very sharp on these jerseys yeah it does i i, I mean my only takeaway is it does look a little bit like the wish.com version of us jerseys um <laughs> especially the uh the the pseudo bomb pop but far and away better than um anything we've seen from concacaf and again it's always good to see these smaller uh, kit manufacturers getting involved because it provides a lot more creativity and these teams are getting a lot more uh, design focus rather than just a templated, you know, piece of, uh, you know, athletic apparel off the line. The aesthetics of CONCACAF are just trending up constantly and it's uh, good to see Cuba looking good. And also uh, finally, as, as we've said on the show many times, uh, if you have a jersey and you think we won't critique it, DM us at Pocket Calf. Send us one. I'm a 2X. Uh, Schmidt is an extra XL. medium. And, and, <laughs> and Slape is, is an XL. Lots of Xs involved. So you can just send those to us. And, and if you don't think we will wear your jersey, even though it has sleeves, we will wear it even if it has sleeves. So yeah. uh, go ahead and send them to us. Yeah. They're tight fitting. I'll, I'll go with large. Um, but yeah. Kind of medium large, like a That's why I said extra medium. Yeah, extra medium is like small. No, um, extra medium is extra, like large than extra large, medium than extra medium. You're thinking of a schmedium, which you are not. You are not schmedium. Yeah, I am certainly. Back in the day, I was not a, not anymore. Um. All right, so we got some new kits. Also, have a new manager, uh, Grenada, the Spice Boys. We still got to do our Grenada episode, guys. We got still got game, but Grenada, new senior men's national team head coach uh, Terry Connor, uh, former uh, Wolverhampton man uh, from England. He doesn't really have any history playing in Grenada, but Grenada picks him up. Uh, played many years in England, had one cap with the England U twenty ones. His coaching career, I do have to point this out. He has been a manager. He was manager for Wolverhampton in 2012 as an interim. He managed the team for 13 games. He had zero wins, four draws, and nine losses. So Terry Connor, coming into Grenada, has never won a game as a manager yet. Um, Obviously, Grenada, League A in Nations League ahead. They've got a lot of potential, um, but new manager. Guys, what do you feel about these types of managers that don't really have a lot of national team experience, but they're almost a name? Do you feel like that is more beneficial or having more experienced people? I think for some of these countries, like especially some of the smaller nations, having the name is not as much like I think it helps with some recruitment of dual nationals, especially with what we know about like with the Caribbean having such ties to, you know, especially England, but like European soccer in general, there being so many people over there that, you know, are dual citizens. I think it plays a huge role and is hugely beneficial um, to have a name that's then able to help recruit 
and build the program? I think for me, it's not necessarily a general, you know, one way or the other. I think there's it's a mixed bag when it comes to the results that come from this. But I will say this, having, you know, like a former, you know, national team legend or a local club legend take over is about drumming up excitement in your fan base. And I think for some of these teams in some of these, you know, nations, it's not necessarily about, hey, getting the best guy with the best experience. It's about seeing it, one, testing out somebody who can maybe improve in their stature as a coach and kind of learn on the job. But also it's about a fan base and energizing them. I mean, just like, you know, for some co- you know, for some uh, clubs here in the United States, when they say, oh, this club legend is coming back to coach, people get excited. They may not think that they're going to do well but they at least get excited about the possibility of someone coming back to help their club out. Yeah. So Terry Connor taking over from interim coach, Anthony Modest, who's going to be moving to an assistant job and Grenada, of course, preparing for gold cup prelims against they take on Guiana on June 17th. Uh, last thing we want to get to, and I think it's important to mention because you know, we don't just cover the men's side. We cover the women's side. Uh, CONCAF W Gold Cup qualifying is going to be starting soon. Actually, if you're listening to this podcast on the day it's released, uh, May 17th, the draw is May 17th for the CONCAF W Gold Cup qualification. Um, they had announced the groups for the draw previously, and last week CONCAF came out and announced Oh, by the way, Cuba, St. Lucia, and Bonaire will also participate. So those three countries will be slotted into League C and will be included in the draw to set the groups for this competition. Uh, That actually takes the total of teams who are participating up to 33, um, which is great. It's not all of CONCAF, but we've talked in a lot of our laser focuses about how not every country is participating or putting focus on their women's program. We've got 33 nations, which doesn't even include the United States participating in this competition. Yeah, I like it. Um, it, it I don't think it includes Canada either, right? Or is Canada involved in this? Uh, it um, depends Canada, on Jamaica. it. It depends on the Olympic play-in loser. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So the teams that have already qualified will not be participating in this. So the U.S. is already through. Mm-hmm. Um and wh- whichever team loses that Olympic plan is going to be in league A. I mean, look, we talk we talk so much about how much we love the Nations League, and I'm glad that the women are finally getting to experience this. Um, and, and honestly, I hope that they make it where it's a competition where again that the United States, Canada, the big the big teams on the women's side get to experience this uh, through the group states, experience some of the travel, you know. Imagine the U.S. women going to one of these islands and playing a game. I think that would be a bigger challenge for them than it is for the men's side, you know, going to some of these nations. And even though the the quality of some of these teams might not be as good, I think one thing that this does is bring people out of their comfort zones. And Canada and the United States are among two teams that rarely leave their home soil to play games. And I think this would be a competition that would be well suited to get them out of their comfort zone and learn that, hey, you're not going to win every World Cup in the United States. You're going to win World Cups sometimes by playing in Jamaica at the office or playing in Costa Rica or, you know, again, some of these help energize also bring some energy to some of these teams that they're playing as well. Get people packed into stadiums. And and honestly, the women deserve to travel the world, too, and get to see some of these cool sites for sure. Yeah, I was going to say I think there are a few like you know there's a lot of excitement like when the u.s goes to the men's team goes to play some of these you know smaller nations but like i don't think we've seen the type of excitement you would see even in a place like jamaica or like some of the bigger countries if the u.s women showed up to play a game like that would be just you know massive for the the growth of the sport especially the women's side of the game in the region yeah listen you can beat uzbekistan in a friendly out in LA, we can do it on a rainy night in Bridgetown. You know, U- U.S. women got to prove themselves and get some nice beach vacations out of it. So, all right, yeah. So that draw not available yet. Keep an eye out for that coming up 
again, that draw taking place in Miami on May 17th. So that wraps up the Newswire. Guys, it's been a pleasure podcasting again. Um, we, have, Yeah, it's, it's been a minute, but we have Nations League coming up. We've got the Gold Cup coming up. We've got the Women's World Cup coming up. We've got a lot to talk about. So whenever we finish recording tonight, we are going to sit down with our calendars and start, you know, penciling in some sessions to make sure you guys get all the hot CONCACAF content you deserve. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, where can people find you? The You can find me at jsleepssp and then at Broadway Sports Media. Donald, where are you at? At Blazing DW, also part of the USA Soccer Cast, and at starsandstripesfc.com. And what's the handle for that USA Soccer Cast? At USA Soccer Cast. You should check it out. It's really good. Donald's on it. I highly <laughs> recommend. Uh, thanks again for listening. Follow us at podcacaf, P-O-D-C-A-F, on all social media. If you want to reach us by email, podcacaf at gmail.com. Also, you can buy stuff from our store. If you go to our social media and go to our link tree, you got a link to our spring store uh, with all of the Podica Calf merch that you could ever need. Get suited up for Nations League, Gold Cup, and whatever beaches around the region await you. Um, thanks for listening, and tune in to one more round on our Patreon.